the ground shifting. There's a culture switch. People are getting hungrier for something that's not out there. And that's what I'm hoping worship leaders and songwriters like I really encourage them to rise up, to start writing what the Lord wants to hear so that we have this culture shift where what we're writing is validated by heaven. I cannot work to please man. And there came a point where I went, I just don't, I don't, I'm not chasing any of that. Say so if you build, you knock down doors and you build a kingdom, like you've got to keep it. You've got to keep it going. Hey everyone, guess who joins me this time on the Rudy Springer podcast? None other than the great Francesca Battistelli. Love Franny, love her music. And I hope you love this interview with us. It was a lot of fun, so come join me. Are there moments in your life or were there moments in your life where, like I had the moments with extreme loss, and I mean, I lost my parents when, when I was young, and there was just so much grief and the fracture of grief and what grief does in, in the, um, the breeding of loneliness, like God's not for you, he's not with you. So for me to end up being a worship leader, worshiping courage over people, um, worship just almost became like this ointment, like this oil. Like in your life, were there moments that, that you were drawn more to worship than almost like contemporary Christian music because it did something to your soul? Yeah. Oh, for sure. I mean, I can think of several different times where, you know, it's literally the only thing that gets you through because sometimes you can't even study, you know, like, yeah. or I'll listen to the word or something like that, but being able to just be raw and real with the Lord and yeah. lay on your bed with the Lord and worship. I mean, if I'm going to put on music, it's pretty much always going to be yeah. worship. Um, so it's it's funny to me that so much of my writing isn't that. Yeah. But it's not because I don't love it and it's not like the heartbeat of my life, truly. Um, when we, yeah, when we first moved down to the country, yeah, I was like, what? You know, there were moments of like, oh my goodness, did we do the right thing or whatever? And so being able to just, it's like a language with the Lord of, I can, I can speak to him and I, you know, like through just, just worshiping mm. and obviously alone is the, is the time I can do it in church, but it's like, yeah. I'm just me and him. That's when it. Which you probably don't have many of those moments. <laughs> <laughs> Only because of the kids. Like I'm locking myself in the yeah, bed. Yeah. Don't go in. Is there a certain song, like even maybe if it's from your youth, I know for me, the shifting of being at a Baptist church and having the hymn uh -huh. right there in front of you, and then the the Maranatha, you know, praise kind of chorus book right there, yep. and um, uh, for the oh Lord my God is over the earth when that song was sung. I could feel the difference between that and the old rugged cross. Was there a song in your youth that you, when you first heard it, you, you just either started to melt or cry where you were like, I feel more of a connection with God in that song? Well, I mean, this is not because I'm sitting here with you. Literally every time anyone asks me this question or anything like it, yeah. it's worth it all. Wow. I remember the first time I heard it, um, I was 17 and I was just what is this song? I had to, I found out. Oh, oh, it was at a youth prayer night and it was just playing over the loudspeaker. It was your voice. And it was so, it's true. I mean, it's still a song that I would go to. It's just, that's so sweet. When you open your mouth to sing, the clarity for me on your voice has always just been like, there's just this clear thing that happens when you sing where I don't think I've heard anything like it. The only the only person I've ever compared you to is Hope Darst, because Hope has this kind of this clear thing when she when she sings as well. How did it start for you? Like you're you're the crazy thing about you, Randy, is that you're an only child, but you have six kids. So I want you to like to just go back to the to the beginning and how you yeah came into came into this whole scene in music. My parents come from Broadway music theater world. Yeah. My dad was a conductor, um, conducted at Radio City Music Hall and on Broadway and a trumpet player as well. So he's just like 
brilliant, has his doctorate, you know. And my mom was an actress and a singer. So they actually met on the national tour of The King and I. So she becomes the youngest Mrs. Anna on, on, the, on The King and I. They lived in New York. They got married the next year, got saved radically at this like Pentecostal Holiness Church, like, you know, um, wheelchairs on the wall kind of church in, in somewhere in New York. Somewhere in New York. And um, then they had me a year later. So I really loved dance and theater and music, and they were kind of like, you know, like not wanting to really push me into it. But in middle school, I wanted to audition for um, this like dinner theater production, like a real, you know, equity theater in Orlando. I mean, it wasn't huge, but yeah, uh, for The Sound of Music. And my mom was like, well, if you're going to do this, I'm going to just audition with you. She's like, I've still got an old headshot. I just kind of want to be there and watch. So we both got cast. So I kind of like dragged her back into that world. Wow. Like, so I think that was kind of the beginning for me of like, I want to make people feel the way that made me feel. Right. So it was ballet and theater for the longest time. I even went to um, UCF for musical theater. I was in their program for a year. And then I was like, the Lord totally in that sort of season, like switched my heart for worship. So I finished college just with an English degree and... um and wrote my first record. At UCF. At UCF, yeah. Wrote a record at 19, recorded it. It's real, you know, not great. But <laughs> did you have a label at that? No, no, I was independent. Um, one of my- And you just did it? Yeah. One of my dad's friends, were, you know, produced it, and the other one used his studio. Were you writing your own songs? I was, yeah. I was playing guitar, and there was this coffee shop that I would set up at every Friday night. My dad would come with our little, like, dinky speakers, and I'd play for- I mean, sometimes nobody, sometimes people would yeah on the guitar, but it was such good training. It was two years of that. Like, I'm not super phased when I walk on a stage now. <laughs> right, right. It's like so much. And it was like this way of getting me past myself a little bit. I literally thought I'm a songwriter who kind of can sing. Like, that's how I viewed myself. Oh, probably until a, a couple kids into my career. Where it was like, OK, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, guess I yeah. can sing, you know? Um, and I don't know why that is, but I'm thankful. I had great relationships with my label, but there were some other people kind of mm -hmm. that were not yes men at all. We're not they're almost to the point of like, well, you could be a little kinder. <laughs> no, but I'm saying yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of we're always put putting the yeah. business side of it. Yeah, the business very side of it. Just very like you're no, that's not you know what I'm saying? Like not letting me get a big head. And I'm thankful because I've seen it happen the other way where you're surrounded by people who are telling you just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you believe it wow that's very uh, to me very strategic on the lord's part um and my husband and i talk about it and it's like we can just look back and see the threads of how he has yeah just kept us humble and i mean i even I, i've definitely gotten caught up in caring about the wrong thing yeah i think that comes with the territory though don't you think it comes with the territory it's really hard to avoid yeah everyone is telling you how important these things are yeah whether you're doing them or not it's like well you've got to sell this much and you've got to get this radio you yeah gotta get yeah tickets and and did you have any clue how how much more you would be like in the spotlight and how much more that i mean at that point were you like well that's the potential that's what we're working toward but when you start having kids that stuff just looks different and you just didn't have one kid it's kept up. I know. <laughs> yeah, we really, it was a really interesting time. And and I would probably do things differently looking back. We did a lot of touring with our first two. And then by the time we had number three, we really felt uh, just the Lord saying pull back. Yeah, yeah. And at that point, I was at doing the best. You know, I'd come off like the busiest two years of my career. And it wouldn't it didn't make sense to go so i think that uh that was when we intentionally were going okay lord how can we we want to we want to obey and we want to be home with our family we want touring to not be the norm we want it to be the the um, exception to the normal life that we create mm -hmm. and, and how we don't how are we going to do that and i honestly can't tell you how we've done it for the past yeah however many years that's been seven years but he has just continued to provide i mean we have toured very little in the last 
seven years. No, that is the main source of income. I mean, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the fact that we, we truly go, it's just the Lord. Like we can't explain it. With the music, you know, Franny, when you get married and you start having kids, just sending a kid off to college, you know, for me, it was like, oh, that's 18 years of a role that's no, that I'm no longer playing. Yeah. And it's this overwhelming sense of who, who am I? Because you split your personality into this is what I do. This is the career I've chosen. And you have to you have to kind of pay the piper for that in a sense because it's what you love to do. It's not like you don't love to do it. But how with six kids do you find passion to write the songs and, you know, and all I mean, I had one and I, I could I could balance that out pretty well. But for you, are you do you have to fall back in love with doing what you're called to do? Yeah, I do. I do. It's I I live now. 90% of the time in just mom war. Yeah, we'd have to. Yeah. I forget. I literally forget about this world over here. And it's only when I am sort of forced to step back into it only because it's on the calendar or, you know, we've committed to something or I want to write with some people. And I'm like, oh, yeah, this is me. <laughs> you know? No. So it's like, it's good to be with this person again. Um, but I, but I, but we both feel absolutely. Like, that's the way it, it should be for us oh. at this point. You know, like, it feels right. Um, he has continued to bless us with children, and they are a blessing. They're hearing yeah. a burden. I mean, our society views them that way, but uh, we go, if he continues to give us these blessings, then he's going to give us what we need to, you know, raise them up yeah. in that ministry of the Lord and still honor our commitments and, and do the things that he's called us to over here. So, you know, when I started, Worship was was not a commodity. You know, it was, there was just this beautiful side of worship still where, you know, I, we were writing songs because people were healing. God was healing people in services. And I know with, with you, one of the biggest songs wasn't a song that you wrote, but you chose to do, which was so interesting to me because Holy Spirit, when you released Holy Spirit, our followings are different. <laughs> like the... The people that listen to me, I mean, radio would say to me, I remember back in the day, radio said, we can't play you because you'd scare people off the radio. Ah. But somebody like your voice would not scare people off the radio because it was kind of this soothing thing. For me, it was like, we're doing this, we're going. Um, if you're not coming with me, I'm, I'm, you're just going to be left on the side of the road, you know? But you have been able to actually bring in these things and, and then present them to, um, the audience and to almost like the the heads of churches and stuff that are like, well, if Franny does it, we're okay with it because we trust Franny in the midst of it, where I wouldn't be trusted because of the renegade almost posture in Pentecostal churches that, so how have you like, as you did that with Defender, yeah. when you took Defender, you did the same thing. I mean, my own church that I was on staff with wouldn't do Defender for such a long time because it was a little scary. Yeah. Where's your push on the envelope? Or do you feel like God's called you to to find that beautiful line and merge the beauty of, of saying things like, Holy Spirit, you're you're welcome here to a, a almost a a group of, of Christian church followers that primarily kind of wouldn't do that. It's so funny. I mean, Defender, I'll start with. I just I mean, I remember driving Whole Foods, Green Hills. Yeah. Like almost stopping the car the first time I heard it. Like, what is this song? I yeah. loved you since I was like 17. So I have I was like, I know I'm going to love this album, but that song just arrested me. I was like, I'm going to do this today. And it was several years. Yeah. Later, but um, that was just, I'm putting this on the album. And they were like, okay. And it didn't fit the album at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it's the poppiest record I've ever done. But I was just like, I'm doing it. And then they wanted to take it to radio. It's like, okay, wow. let's try. Um, Holy Spirit was, I was leading worship. Like we were going to visit our friends in Amarillo, Texas, of all places. And he was a worship leader. And um, he asked if I would lead worship the, the week we were there uh, at their youth group. He said, we're going to do these songs. And I didn't know any of them. And Holy Spirit was one of them. And we sang it. And I was like, I heard this is a good song. Like, I didn't know Katie. Yeah, yeah. So, 
So you hadn't heard of them singing it. I hadn't heard them singing it. I just knew it from my friend. Yeah. And so then we were starting a tour right after that. And I was like, I love, what if I just did a worship song in the middle of the set? Like that, maybe that's weird, but this is kind of like my, where everything started for now. And so we started doing Holy Spirit. It wasn't on a record, nothing. I just like, I like this song we did last month. Let's do it. And it started becoming just a really special moment of the night. People actually like stood up and raised their hands and worse, you know, and it was like, yeah, this is powerful. This song is powerful. And so my radio team came to a show and they were like, you need to record that song. It needs, we need to do this song. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. Well, and the radio was like, which their entire purpose is to sell album. Right. They were like, we need to single this as the second single off my like third album. And I was like, okay. Off the deluxe version. Yes, it wasn't even, that's what I'm saying. Like it didn't even fit their agenda, if you will. But they just saw that it was a moment and we did, but we didn't think it would do oh. what, you know, what it yeah, did. But it's literally, I think still to this day is the best. And as an artist, like, and as a worshiper, why do you think, because it's actually encouraging to me to hear you say that it was that group that was like, no, that song, because it, it, it gives me hope that, that it's radio can hear something special yeah because it's not that's that's not always the killies so that's kind of i'm I'm sitting here kind of in shock being like what the radio said oh totally, no it was like a it was totally the both lord. the defender too it's like what yeah it was totally the lord both times yeah um it was totally the lord both times to me because it didn't make sense even with their history i mean i've had to fight them on other songs but i didn't have to fight either yeah and do you feel like that's i'm always interested in those of us that are in this because we're in it and how are you, how do you process what God is doing within worship in the church? Because those type of things are God moments where I, I'm always, when a song like that goes, I'm like, what was God wanting to do that only that song could do that had to cross the barriers of what's not the normal for how man make the rules and set up all the rules? And then a song like that is the one that ends up in 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 people's hearing even i mean i didn't have a lot of context for even having a worship song on a caleb yeah until that happened yeah you know we did holy spirit then we did i mean i've literally gotten this is too too much jesus too worshipful this is not enough jesus this is not worshipful enough it's like i cannot work to please man (laughs) when it comes to writing songs it's it's unbelievable the things that you will hear from one you know Oh, yeah. He's into it neither. And you go, but it's the entirely opposite of what you had just said, but okay. And and there came a point where I went, and it was before this last record, it was before Defender. I was like, I just don't, I don't, I'm not chasing any of that. Yeah. What happened, everything that's happened has been completely against the odds. You know, I remember being told um, when I was first signed, like, well, don't expect to sell more than, you know, X amount of records because you're a female. Don't expect to get any radio play. Like, Great. don't expect this stuff. And so I just didn't. And so when things happened, literally like being on that Winter Jam tour and seeing this line and then seeing this song and I was like, that's not supposed to happen. Right, right. Because they've already told you it's not supposed to happen. Yeah. And that's how it's just always been. And then the songs that I go, this is definitely, this is the song, you know? Yeah. And then they're like, oh yeah. Like it does, it's just so funny to me. So I learned a long time ago, it's fully in the Lord's hands. I didn't, I don't think surrender, I didn't surrender it fully until recently when everything happened with my label and it's totally different and I have no control and I really fought that for years like but you have to do it right you have to do it right and take this song and Defender was one of them like do better guys do better yeah and the Lord is just being so good and kind to show me that he like I feel like I create this piece of art and then I give it to these people and I hope they do well with it and he's like it's not up to them it's it's mine. Yeah. I will take it to the people that need to hear it. And whether that means it has a massive success or mm. is, you know, not, the people that need to hear the songs will hear the songs. And so that's where I'm at moving into this next season. Like, it was so hard for me to go, let's make another record because I didn't want to hand it over in a season where there was a lot of transition and, yeah. you know, difficult things at my label. And now I'm just going, they don't control that. The Lord, yeah. the Lord does. So um, we'll see where you... Well, I think that's the... I, You know, I was asked the other day, 
because I'm I'm so old. But <laughs> but I you know I I when I made battles where Defender was on, it was a conversation two years prior to the making of that record with the Lord, where He said, "I want you to do another record," and um, you know I, I remember I was on my way to gather, um, and up in Reading, and I pulled off the side of the road, and I was I just threw up. And the Lord was like, let's talk about that as opposed to you making a record. Why does the, the mention of that make you feel like that? Because I love worship and I, I love the art of writing songs and I love the um, leading worship. I've always loved that. That's been my go-to. But when the business side of it comes in, there's a tainting that you do when you're signed with the label. And it, again, it's like there's there's so many positive things to that as well. So it's not just all a negative thing, but when you're so pressed against the Lord and you really want something to be pure, but you feel like you're the only one on that team. But you're the one, it's your voice, it's your songs, and you're the one responsible for what you sing. And you're the one responsible for what you put out, but somebody else is paying for it. And somebody else is has the responsibility to make that presentable it's it's just a dance that I've never loved. And there have been, you know, there have been great seasons, but trying to fight through that, you know, even this year, I, I'm not with the label anymore, which is actually, I'm just in a season where I'm like, I don't really, I don't have a desire to have to do touring. I mean, I make my living on the road, so you have to kind of do that. But, and I love the people, but the Lord said again, you know, in January of this year, I want you to make another record. And again, it was just like, oh, I don't want to join the circus. Like, I don't want to join the circus again. And I think it's this thing that we should talk about more because you kind of tapped in on it a little bit. I do not see, and I, this is not a big, like, I am woman, hear me roar kind of a thing. I'm just not. I mean, I'll, I'm all about women rising up to their potential. Absolutely. But it is really still fascinating to me at 56 years old how women artists are treated so differently than men and how um, it, it is, you know, I don't see uh, labels looking for 15, 16 year old boy. Right. <laughs> they just don't. They look for the, the girls and, and then they, they try to mold and take control and try to shift these girls and do what, and I, it, it almost is like unnerving to me because I'm just like, if these young girls have this anointing on them and a, and a label sees that, it's like, how do we, how do you, when you're doing what you're doing, do you ever posture yourself in language to talk to, to young women? What do you say to young women that come up to you and that are like, I, Tiffany Hudson of Elevation, and I've had this conversation where she's like, yeah, it's a really hard one. These young girls come up to her at these events and are like, how do I do what you do? How do I do? It? And what they're really asking for in this day and age is how do I get on stage with the smoke machines and do all that thing and bypass all of this stuff that it should never like be about? You know, they're not asking the right questions because the model is a label, the, the, the touring, the this, the that, all the glory. How do you position yourself in conversation when you're out there with with young girls? And what do you say to them? I know. I I say, don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I really keep it simple and say, here's the deal. If you feel like you are gifted and, and the Lord has laid a desire in your heart to sing and lead worship, then do that wherever you can. Be faithful where he's put you um, and trust him to open doors if he wants to. Because I remember we toured with Jeremy Camp years ago and we used to do these Q&As all the time where people would ask him that question. And he would always say, if you build, you knock down doors and you build a kingdom, like you've got to keep it. You've got to keep it going. He said, but if you let the Lord build it, it's hit. It's hit. Yeah. And, you know, I try to tell people, that and just it's not as you know it's not it's not what it looks like this is a tiny little piece of it and yeah. it's fun it's the best part yeah but um but it's a really small part of it yeah and no no one really hears it but 
hopefully some of them. Yeah. Do you do you think we're in a do you think we're in a kind of a different day and age with with um with worship leading? Like where do you think worship's going? Question. I I think what you said earlier about it kind of being commodified or whatever word you used has made me do this for several years. Um, it's hard for me to even listen to a lot of worship music because I've been in the rooms where you hear the comments and it's like we're trying to um, create something to succeed. Yeah. Um, because it didn't used to be that way because no. I said it wasn't on the table. Yeah. Writing worship songs for our church. Right. So for me, that's where my heart is and I'm just kind of stepping out of the circus tent and and going, I'm just going to write songs that my church would sing, yeah, and that I can sing with my people at our, you know, worship nights that we do at our house, and and if God wants to do something else with it, great. But that's really what we've been trying to to do, yeah, and not even really be looking at what what the next thing, yeah. Um, but that's not to say that everyone doing worship is, you know, what I'm saying, you, yeah, yeah. Um, it's just it it. It's not something I pay a lot of attention to anymore. Um, because I also have always felt a little bit on the outside of it. Or, you know, you you have CCM and you have worship and they've always kind of been like, yeah, and things. Yeah, because your new record's worship, you said. That's true. Uh, it's congregational. I mean, to me, that's yeah. what I mean. Because obviously, I see everything that I do as worship as unto the Lord. Um, but when you're going to turn it into genres they're going to call this a worship album and I'm great with that. Yeah. Um but I don't know where it's going. I just want to be faithful more the Lord has put me in. Yeah. Post COVID like when you what cuz it's your is this your didn't you do a Christmas record though after COVID? I did. Yeah, during COVID. You know. Yeah. I remember that. And your was that a good experience for you the Christmas record? Was it your first? Was it your first okay. second Christmas record? Yeah, I was not gonna do that. My my publisher came to me and was like, "What if you put out a Christmas song this year, a new one?" And I was like, "I did a whole record." And he's like, "Yeah, but just just sit with like two of your favorite writers and see if you can write one Christmas song." I'm like, "Fine." I sat with Molly Grayson Reed and um, Jeff Pardo. We wrote two songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, "Why?" Well, I, I loved them both. They were completely different. We have to release them both. So then I was, "Well, what if we?" Do one more and call it an EP. And I have just always had this weird thing against EPs. And I was like, fine, we'll do it. And so it turned into a whole thing. But I was supposed to make a my fifth record that year. It was 2020. And this, I knew doing a Christmas record would push everything a little bit. Um, so it was it was great. Yeah. And then now we're, I'm finally, yeah. finally doing another one. Because it took me a little bit. I mean, COVID was COVID and Again, there was so much transition yeah. on the business side for us that it was just hard for me to enter back into that. Yeah, if you don't, if you don't, you have to love this. You have to love it on all angles because it's it'll it'll strain it from the label side, from the marketing side. It just strains a lot of that stuff. I think that's what people don't understand. It's like when you really want to do something pure with a pure intention, and and sometimes you're the only one that comes to the table with the pure intention. It, it's so important for people that listen to know that when they're listening to something and they're really um, taken in by it, it's because there's been a process in that. And a lot of times it's a fight to get to the end result of that. And uh, that's why I've always appreciated people like you when, they're, when their records come out and you're like, oh, that one took a fight. But then there's the dust on the end of it that's like, you know, worth the, it's worth the thing. But it's always the dance. It's a little circus dance we do. So, and I'm, I think at 56, I'm like, oh, I don't want that. Well, and then the shifting of just the, the industry and how the, you know, I mean, it's, you remember the download era and all that stuff coming in. I mean, I came in way before the download era. So I've seen this, I've seen this give and pull, the shifting, cracking earthquake of like, and it's so different now that it's just such a social presence that you have to have and it's like oh my gosh just getting out of bed in the morning but <laughs> getting out get off to high school Seriously. was like enough for me so and I can't imagine on the side for you because you you were living you you lived not far from me and you were in kind of this 
you you did this kind of remodel that you were doing online because you've got like this creative side to you that loves all that. And then you ended up like chucking yep. both houses <laughs> and you moved out to like the <laughs> sticks, you know, and, and basically created your own homestead. Yeah. So how is that been? Because that's a whole other. It's another layer. I mean, that is another to layer. Lives. I know. No, it's amazing. It's one of those things that we we wanted and prayed for for so many years, but felt so out of reach. Yeah. A, like living in this area where everything is so expensive. Yeah. B, just being on the road. It's like, well, we can't have animals. But, um, yeah, 2020, we finished that remodel. We moved back into the house. It took seven months. It was supposed to take seven weeks. We moved back to, to the house. We were there two months, and it was like, so that's what it was. You just were like, okay, we've remodeled this. Not ours. We've done it online. Yeah, we're like. Everybody knows what our house yes. is. So like, and now you're just like, eh. There's someone else. Like, it literally was like, don't scratch those counters. So we moved back into our studio. Because it was kind of like a cross the street. Cross the street. Lyric. Yeah. Okay. And we moved back into that. And it's tiny. And, I mean, compared. Yeah, to what you were building. Yeah. But, yeah, it wasn't. Actually, it was a great house. I love that great house. house. Anyway, so we lived there going, okay, Lord, what? we don't know what you want us to do, but we knew we were supposed to do that. Here we are in this smaller house with more children than we've ever had. Now we're homeschooling. What do we do? Do we like, because that house needed some work if we we're going to stay in it. Do we yeah. pour it into here? But our heart's desire was to be able to open the doors and let the children just run, run free. And we couldn't do that there. I mean, it was, yeah. it was a sweet neighborhood, but. Um, so we started looking and looking and looking and looking and it was 2020. And then a couple weeks later, this house popped up that I had seen before, but had written off because it was so far. And I showed it to Matt and he was like, it was the night of the presidential debate. I remember that. <laughs> and I was like, forget that. Look at this house. And he was like, well, I don't know why you haven't called them already to see if we can go see it tomorrow. And I was like, okay. And we drive an hour away and it's, it was February, January, I don't know. It's cold. And we're driving and there's no snow anywhere. Then we like turn this curve on our road and it, all of a sudden it's Narnia. It's like magical. The snow has just hit this wide oh. section of our town. And we pull up and it was for sale by owner. So they were there. They had the fire going. I mean, it was like oh, wow. magical. But then we're like, okay, this is a big deal. Let's come back. You know, let's come back. So we came back the next day with our my parents and our realtor. And she was like, well, if you don't buy it, I am because this is an amazing opportunity. So we we said yes to the house. And then I went, we went to Oklahoma for a month to make a movie. And it was like, I, we came back and closed like the day after we got got back. So it took us a while to finally move over. Um, and we didn't know what we were doing, but we just jumped in. And so now we have a bunch of like laying hens. We have ducks, bees zillion barn cats and we just went in a pasture to eventually do some beef wow yeah. so you're doing the whole thing the whole thing and we have a big garden that's beautiful and but how do you keep it all up with just the two of you to put the kids to work and they all have chores see too they help a lot they help a lot the garden i i could use a little more diligence this year like i let it go a little bit it's big the kitchen is tiny like i literally don't know how again it's one of those like how the Lord has made it work for right. us. <laughs> Six children is amazing. I mean, you, you are you going to have more kids? Maybe. Wow, so you're ready, you're, you're willing to have even more kids. And that's a gift. I mean, what's the number? Do you have a number? We really don't. Do people think you're Mormon? Uh, yeah, that a Catholic. <laughs> I get that a lot. Well, by now they're old enough to all help out. For sure. Yeah. I really feel like it's easier now than it was when I had two. Yeah, because how old's your youngest now? He's one and a half. One and a half. And my oldest just turned 13, so. Wow. Yeah. Ooh, it's a crew. I mean, I come from six, too, and that was, it was great. I mean, I, honestly, siblings, there's nothing like siblings. That's awesome. So just like, tell me, tell me what your, I don't know, what's the, what's the next decade for you? Like, in family, um, family music and relationship with God, where do you want to be in those things? Like, what are you looking forward to in the next? Because I always feel like God does some of the best work in us in decades. Like, it, sometimes it takes him a decade to 
get stuff out of us and pour stuff into us. Like, what are you looking forward to in the next decade in music, in family, and what do you want to see in the church? That's so good. Huh. Music-wise, I want to... I want to make both of these records. Do you have any hope? Like, God said anything to you about it? I just, I feel peaceful about it. I don't feel, I'm not wringing my hands, which I definitely was with the last one. Mm -hmm. I feel very much like out of the driver's seat in a good way. Has the writing process for you been good on this record? Really good. Oh, good. It's been really Who's producing this record? Um, Ian Esklin. He's on the best. Yep. Yeah. Good old Ian. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I feel very hopeful about, like, I feel good about the songs, and I'm hopeful that they will minister to people. We would love to do more ministry as a couple. My husband is amazing and has been is still so content to just be back here. Um, but he's a he's a preacher, and I'm excited to see what the Lord could do with that. I really have vision for um, just the local church and seeing how I have a heart for real covenant community and like I'm, I've seen a taste of it and I've, I've seen sort of like what it could be mm. and really doing life with people and like mm. holding each other accountable and living in a way that is more than what we do and watching my kids grow and hopefully grow with people that, you know, they'll end up marrying and, and you know, like. Yeah, because you got quite a community out there and they're yeah. in school. Yeah, so we'll see. Who knows what the Lord does. And so you... Like, what about church? Do you go to church? We yeah, have been um, at a sweet little church plant for a couple years, but I feel like the Lord is stirring something, and I don't know what it's going to look like. We meet on Fridays with like, several other families, and that's where I feel the most like this is kind of the church, you know? I know. We're eating together, and the kids are running around, and we're worshiping, and we're going through the Word. Mm -hmm. um, it's been really sweet, so... Wow. I don't, know. I don't know what the Lord will do, but... And then what do you think he's doing in the church? Have, do you ever talk to the Lord about that stuff? Yeah, I think that... I think that, I mean... Because it's been crazy. It's been crazy. Yeah. It's been a big sifting. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to continue. I don't see it getting... fluffier. Yeah. <laughs> that sense. Like, I think it's going to yeah. get more refined and... Because I think it's going to be tougher to be a church, mm -hmm. to be a biblical church, and to, you know, really follow the commands of the Lord <laughs> and, and live in this world. Like, I don't think that's getting easier. I could be wrong. Um, but I think we're in a, we're in a season of, of hard, but I think that mm -hmm. that is often when the church, the true church rises but, up, right? And Yeah. I know I was out in... Um, the Pacific Northwest, and they always say up there, you know, it's so funny when people give disclaimers. Which I get it. I just, I'm always thinking ahead of the game, thinking, I don't know if that's what the Lord would call this area. But they were like, oh, you know, it's just a graveyard for churches and for church plants out here. And I'm like, and if you keep calling this a graveyard, all it's ever going to be is a graveyard. But I'm like, how do you call something a graveyard when he came out of the grave? You know what I'm saying? It's a church. We're, we're so it's, I'm always like, man, what you call a graveyard, I wonder what the Lord's potential. And if, as if we, if we like started to actually say, I think this, this place could be an incredible place for God to redeem, you know, you know what I'm saying? Just be more positive. And that's, I, I so looking forward to people maybe speaking a little bit more positive about, about the fact that if it really looks like it's bad, that means, I mean, Every time I read the Bible, when something got really bad, God did something really amazing. Oh, I, you know, so it's almost like this preparation for something. And I've had to actually tell myself that even in worship, when I've become so heartbroken over what I see in worship leaders and the response of, you know, of people who are doing it just for the wrong reasons. And it's just so heartbreaking. Last year was such a heartbreaking year for me in the industry, just watching people have such a rough time. And and then think that it's about something that it's just never about. But the Lord kept reminding me, like, ah, but if it really is this bad, then what is it? What's the opposite of really bad? You know, what do I want to do? So I, I, that's my hope is that, is that if we become people who really want the presence of the Lord, I've always felt like the, even the, the 
um, music, Christian music has a culture shift every decade or so where um, I was talking to somebody yesterday. We were talking about, I came here know, years ago. Now it's like 20 years ago. And I remember the guy I was talking to was like, yeah, you know, we've, we've just been to the UK and there's this group in the UK that their songs are so wordy. No one will ever sing their songs here. Like they're never going to do well. And I just out of curiosity, I said, who was that group? And they're like, this group called Delirious. And they got this song called Did You Feel the Mount Strumble? No one will ever sing that song in church. <laughs> and I just started laughing because, you know, they had the, that series back then called In the Can, where all their CDs were in this little tin can. And I just, I ate that stuff up. And we were doing Did You Feel the Mount Strumble in church? And it's just, it was that, it was that thing of, oh, the ground shifting. There's a culture switch. People are getting hungrier for something that's not out there. And and that's what I'm hoping worship leaders and songwriters like really encourage them to rise up, to start writing what the Lord wants to hear, so that we have this culture shift where what we're writing is validated by heaven. And and heaven's like coming up alongside of us saying, Hey, this is what's gonna change and shift a culture of of a generation who thinks God's just a smoke machine. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much for coming all the way out. I mean, six kids, a farm, chickens, goats, and you took time to to come up to the city. But thanks so much. All right, we'll be looking out for, do you have a name for your record yet? I don't. Okay. Still working. 2024. Yeah, sometime. Sometime in 2024. Probably summer. Be looking out for Francesca Battistelli's new worship record. Thank you so much.